And we're back. Greetings and salutations. Thank you for tuning in. I am Neil Isaacs, the Raleigh business broker, and I'm super, super excited to have a guest with me today. I'll, I'll introduce her and then I'll invite her to add on to that. Susan Wass is with me and she owns two companies. She's a 27 plus year veteran of the salon and affiliated industries. She has a lot of experience in her two companies. One is a software company and she's in the staffing business for, for busy salon owners and spas, barbershops that look to hire. And she does some connecting of the, of the salon owners. with If they're ready to buy or sell, she can make those connections. She's a sharp, sharp woman. Um, I like to say we're, we're kind of doing different, similar roles and we're meeting kind of in the middle and how we approach these, these deals. So I'm really excited to ex explore that with her. Susan Wass, welcome to the program. How are you today? Hi, Neil. I am great. Thank you for having me on today. I really appreciate all the great content and information that you put out there for people. I just think it's invaluable. So thank you so much. And thank you for, you know, allowing me to connect with you and get to know you. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the same. Likewise, uh, we had a, a conversation. I learned so much from talking to you and uh, we're going to kind of tease out some of the nuggets that I learned and go deeper. But first I want to give you a chance to give yourself a proper introduction. Tell us a little bit about you. So my name is Susan Bosch and I live in the Kansas City area. I've lived here for most of my life. I lived overseas for a while, lived in different areas of Kansas City, um, love to travel. I, you know, several years ago, I, I've been behind the chair as a cosmetologist um, and or a salon owner for now it's been, gosh, almost 29 years. And so I, you know, was it 2016, just sort of had this vision of something more, you know, I mean, not that doing hair isn't enough, it is enough, but it's hard on your body. Yeah. And I really wanted to, you know, sort of um, pursue my connectivity um, skill set because I am a connector by heart. I loved, you know, when I did hair, I loved talking um, to people about, you know, giving referrals, whether it's like plumbers or dentists or Botox or whatever it is. You know, I loved doing that. And so I really wanted to see what I could do for the industry to improve it. And so, yeah, I just kind of grabbed it and ran with it in 2017, started off on a very wild um, adventure. And that that's what that's what Salon Spa Connection is. That's what the journey you started then, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And you mentioned hair behind the chair. I have sold a few salons and I learned early to ask that question. Um, how much hair behind the chair do you do? Because a lot of these these salons are owner operated in the business buyer. We're going to get into this a little bit later, but they're really kind of like, they're thinking, can I replace you? Am I, are you going to take your clients with you? So the, the hair behind the chair thing is a, is one thing that kind of makes the salon industry a little bit different than some others. A lot of businesses are owner operated, but even more so probably in that industry. Agreed. Yep. Agreed. Especially when the owner is um, a lot of their service dollars are accounted for in the overall profit, you know, yeah. it's really kind of, something to assess for sure. Well, let's stay on the industry and in this kind of, that's kind of a shortcoming that I've kind of pointed out to, but you know, how do you see the salon and I know it's salon spas and barber shops that kind of that you serve. How do you see them as a unique animal compared to other industries? You've seen a lot of, you're a business woman. You've seen a lot of others. What's specific, what's different about this industry than others? Well, you know, we're touching people and we're directly affecting the way people look and feel. And overall, it's a, you know, it's an emotional industry yeah. and, you know, you don't have actually have to have a whole lot of training. Um, you have to like in Kansas City, we have nine month programs to be a cosmetologist, you know, and it's even less for aesthetics and nails. And so we get a lot of um, salon owners that come into the business without a lot of business acumen. And so it's kind of like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to do something better than the place that I am now. And so what that means gets kind of lost in translation to I'm going to make this salon pretty. I'm going to make it fun. I'm going to do this and that. And so I find that that's 
why, and I know that that's probably the case in a lot of different industries, you know, especially like restaurant industries where it's legacy and um, all that good stuff. But I did feel like that's probably the main thing in my dealings with the salon industry that I'm finding is that there isn't a whole lot of prep work that goes into, you know, execution, management, marketing, and yeah. especially exit strategy. It's interesting because, um, this I well, number one, the research suggests that small business in general, there's very poor planning. It's like 75% of owners don't do any planning for their exit in small business. And then if you look at professional services, so I'm going to put salon practitioners and owners in the same category with doctors and lawyers and, and even CPAs and stuff. A lot of times they're great at executing on their craft, but they're less great at the operations of the business or, or this business planning type of stuff. So they can, they can end up with great businesses that are just, they're just kind of winging it a little bit, especially with the, the exit planning. Absolutely. And I think recruitment, since recruitment is one of the things that we do, I think recruitment is one of the biggest um, underestimations of not only spend, but yeah. time and energy. Well, I want to go back to that. So how did you, this idea of recruitment, and I love that you are, serving owners in all stages of their business growth from sourcing talent as they grow their business all the way up to, we'll call it the disposition. When they're done sourcing talent, they've got it big enough or they don't want to do anymore, how to find that buyer. But let's focus on the sourcing of talent for a little bit. Um, you know, How did that evolve as you went from a hair behind the chair to, to building these, these things out? Sure. So my overall plan was just to be a connector here in Kansas City. That was sort of the beginning of um, what I wanted to do. And so that actually meant, you know, not only employment, but with booth rental connections as well. So your independent contractors. And I also wanted people to be aware of education and just yeah. have the information that I kept seeing just sort of all over the place. That was really um, my ultimate goal um, in the beginning stages of my business was to provide that platform for marketing because, you know, Indeed and places like that are not only ineffective, but they just don't provide the type of marketing and translation of opportunity yeah. that I can. And so really that's, that's the core of it um, yeah. from, from the get go. Marketing is where I want to go next. I want to, I want to take a slight detour here before we get into marketing. You mentioned booth rental space back to kind of industry analysis. To me, that's a, that's a major dynamic that I've seen changing. A lot of the independent operators that are running commission style stuff, commission style uh, enterprises, they're getting hurt by this, the growth of the booth rental space. Can you expand? Have you seen that? And tell us what you've seen in that space. Absolutely. And so it's different across, you know, the country, of course. And so on the East Coast, in particular, um, Pennsylvania and New Jersey, those two states actually have outlawed booth rental. Oh, really? However, I know. And so there's there's a really heavy concentration of employee-based salon spas and barbershops in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, however, businesses like Sola, so Sola is like a building full of individual rooms yeah. that are suites. We have those here. They North have, Rome, yeah. absolutely, they're everywhere. And so they have been able to infiltrate um, those states because each room is licensed as a salon. Oh. So it's just this kind of political stuff that I don't fully understand what's going on, but that's the case. And so absolutely, booth rental um, and salon suites have grown exponentially over the last 20 years. I'm going to say in Kansas City, our first booth rental salon was probably, I'm sorry, uh, salon suite was somewhere around 15 to 16 years ago. Uh -huh. And we had two at that time. And now in my immediate area, we have like 55. Wow. It kind of reminds me of the Airbnb type of thing. It's totally different, but you see it kind of peak and then regulation kicks in. And then it, it you know, in, in this market, Airbnb is kind of past the prime. We see a lot of that. Um, but what I do hear from, from owners of we'll call it the traditional method where they're building a commission based salon is it's harder to, to recruit talent because their, their stylist can just go in and set up with this low overhead booth model. And so that's a new alternative they didn't have before. 
Yeah. And so it's easier to get students because all students need jobs. A lot of times they don't go right into Booth Rental, yeah. depending on where you are in the country. And so that is the challenge is to attract people that want to be an employee. Yeah. And so right now in the industry, there's a lot of movement around, you know, what is it we can offer employee based um, people and or people who are kind of on the edge that will attract these people to our salon. And so truth be told, there's a lot of antiquated ideas and um, opportunities out there. And it's yeah. kind of these salon owners who are like, I don't understand what's happening. It's like, well, you haven't evolved, you yeah. know, to offer something that's relevant. And so I see that sort of education shift right now in the yeah. industry. And I'm trying to do my part. I kind of stay in the middle of everybody. I'm not associated with the brand or anything like that. And so I really try to not, you know, piss anybody off which yeah. is hard, um, but <laughs> just I provide that education on what's possible. Right? And that's something you and I have in common. That's what a lot, do a lot of on this channel is just, you know, if you, you share knowledge, then they tend to find new opportunities and there's so much that we can all learn. Well, let's, let's revisit marketing because that is a superpower that you have, Susan. So I want to, you mentioned that Indeed is, is kind of underserving this market. It's, it's, you know, maybe salon owners and, and spas and, and barbershops or maybe not finding what they need on these traditional platforms. But let's talk about how you've done your marketing, how people are finding you and you're becoming that connector that you wanted to be. What's working for you? It seems like you've got some good Google chops. Talk to me about, about. Yeah. <laughs> I love Google and I are friends right now. So yeah. I, I love Google, but yeah. <laughs> so really, you know, I find that the hardest thing about indeed is that, First of all, owners are almost always hiring. You know, there's very few salon, spa, and barbershop owners out there that have full salons. And so, Indeed is incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. And the overall attitude about Indeed, so as a hairstylist, if I'm going on Indeed and I'm looking for a job, I'm seeing a lot of corporate opportunities and not a lot of individual salons. And if I want an individual salon, my perception of what's available on Indeed is not going to be good. And so therefore, I don't get back. Now, they do. I don't go back to Indeed. But they do do a good job. I mean, they're obviously well positioned in Google. They do a lot of good advertising and people are very aware of them. However, I think for instance, I like to apply to some jobs on Indeed for salon owners, yeah. and it's not uncommon for me to have to jump through hoops that are absolutely absurd. For instance, I had to take an electrical and plumbing exam. Wow. Yeah, for, the, the yeah. settings wrong. And so, <laughs> they, yeah. and so I wanted to take all those things away and provide, it's a visual, we're visual people, you know, hairstylists, we, we really like to see those strong visuals, we'd like to see people, we like to see what the salon looks like. So that's what really sets us apart is translating that offer yeah. and being able to provide the visualization that indeed doesn't. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, yeah, because you know, you know, the industry and that's, you're a specialist, which is, is, is huge. And people, people want to talk to somebody who understands their industry. So I can see very, how very quickly you're going to separate yourself from the call it the traditional uh, recruiting platforms. And, um, and you're a matchmaker and, and, and we're kind of, kind of segueing towards brokerage or you know, it's two things. There's growth of, in, of the team and then there's, there's finding opportunities for exit as well. And I think those two things are similar skill sets is it from a matchmaking perspective. So um I think it's really interesting how you marketed yourself. And we were talking before about video and, and uh, alternatives to Google. Google Google can be your friend, but it can also bury you, and which is scary that it's so powerful. Yeah, I know. So, um, yes, it can. I've seen it happen, especially recently with all the new, you know, core updates and all uh -huh. the, oh, my gosh, they're really shaking it up. I mean, you know, they don't like AI content at all. Yeah. And so, they're yeah knocking a lot of people down that were on the rise and it's like oh yeah. i'm glad i didn't do that <laughs> yeah makes makes i did not know that but it makes makes total sense well let's start to pivot towards more of the the brokerage side so we talked about salon spa barbershop owners they need to find talent where they're growing but you've done this long enough that you've seen owners go through probably all the different stages from startup to burnout, to closing the doors, you know, talk to me about 
what you see in the long-term trajectory of, of these owners with their career and kind of what tends to happen when they, when they want to get out? Um, what tends to happen is it's not a huge process, unfortunately. You know, it's interesting because I just did a mastermind with a friend of mine in Boston who owns a similar company to mine. She's one yeah. of my business besties. Yeah. And uh, one of the salon owners, we were talking about selling salons. And one of the salon owners said, I never even considered that I could sell my salon. She said, I thought we would just work, 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 and then close the door someday. Yeah. So I thought that was very telling. You know, mm -hmm. and I think just the thought of being able to sell the business um, for whatever, you know, whether it is a business or whether it's an asset sale, um, just getting um, the education out there that it is possible to yeah. pass this on to someone else. And it looks different for um, everybody, of course. But yeah, I just think, you know, I started this because I was asked to basically. Mm -hmm. I had salon owners in Kansas City that said, hey, um, you know, I'm trying to sell my salon. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. Can you help me? And these questions kept coming in. And I thought, well, I mean, let's give it a shot. Sure. Yeah. And so it definitely started from nothing. I mean, and doing it for free too. So. And now you do this anywhere too. This is way beyond Kansas city. You, you can serve salon oh. owners in anywhere in the country. Is that correct? Absolutely. And we've sold salons internationally as well. Wow. And um, that opens a whole nother can of worms. And um, and we've had some interesting conversations about about that, too. Um, and so let's talk about kind of how you are serving those owners that that do want to exit, because this is something I found super interesting. So me, I'm a we'll call me a traditional business broker. We're talking about traditional salons. I'm a traditional business broker. We typically look for owners that are are kind of a real estate model like they're ready to sell their house but in this case it's their business and then they hire us and we take over and we do it all and we go on this epic hero's journey with them the highs and the lows until we and when they get paid we get paid the majority of our compensations do at closing but i understand you you kind of started this with a different approach so you're kind of more on the front end of the marketing of just finding the buyer and then and then kind of letting them take it from there is that is that kind of how your your connections start talk to us more about that that is how it started and so yes. yeah when we first when i first started listing salons i you know i have the capability in my website to be able to take in applications or increase and so i would just forward them to the owners and i would say you know here's how i can market it and so a lot of it was just experimentation you know figuring yeah. out um, what makes people take action? What are the best platforms to focus on? You know, email marketing, that kind of thing. And so now um, it is it is definitely morphed into something different. And so we offer really sort of um, everything, right? Yeah. So you can just pay the list if you want to. You can hire us for consulting. And then we have add-on services from there. And yeah, I'm just, it's just a strange, it's just grown a lot organically. Yeah. Which is interesting. I love yeah. that. You, you struck upon a, a need and you have the the knowledge and you've added out your services from the very first piece of it, it sounds like. And now you're getting to where you're doing full deals and brokering them is, is what I understand. Your 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 service list is evolving. Um, how do you find those different, like where you started to just make the connection and find the buyers and hand it off to now you're doing more of the deal making, like share some of the stuff that you've learned, the barriers that you've come up against. Talk to us about what you discovered as you got farther into these deals. Yeah, so I would say the biggest thing that I've experienced, especially in the last year, has been issues with um, the landlord. That has been, I'm sure everybody does that, but I've had a host of them where, you know, one of the salons that we listed, the landlord wouldn't let us put up the rental price. So then we got all these inquiries, you know, and it's in a very, very high traffic area, like a prime, prime area. And that's what and every so, buyer wants you know, to know. That's the first question they want to know is what's the I know. One. Yeah, I know. And it was awful because we had, I mean, it is a gorgeous salon. It's an excellent mm -hmm. opportunity. It's definitely more of an asset sale. However, that was um, a, a big buzzkill yeah. <laughs> for yeah. everybody because they would talk to the owner you know i i counseled him and we talked through you know really what the opportunity was you know did an estimation on what we thought we could get for it 
And yeah, I, I'm going to say that we had probably 15 increase. Yeah. And once they found out the rental price, because he had to like, you know, tell them, whisper to them, because like, we can't advertise it. That was it. So yeah. that I think between that and buildings for sale and just complications with the landlord, I would find have been the biggest challenges so far. It's a great point. And, um, and this is something I've talked about with other business brokers, like the lease, is that a proprietary document between the business owner and their landlord? Or, I mean, you could look at the P&L of a business owner and see what they've spent on, on space. So that, that's not really a secret, right? That's that those records belong to the, to the business owner. So it is kind of a touchy subject sometimes what you can share about the lease even if you know what the rent is if it's coming to an end and there's no terms that's kind of a material fact see business savvy business buyers definitely need to know this stuff up front and to an, another extent like if they're going to commit to the deal they got to really understand it and probably negotiate on it um yes landlords i was hoping you'd say that that's our number one challenge and then the you know, do you get into the the financing piece? Have you, have you, you know, how's the interest rates deal affected you, and especially this year? How how's that come into play with with your deals? So the only financing portion that we deal with is just negotiating partial owner financing and what that looks like. Yeah, and so that's just giving education, you know, to the owner because a lot of times they don't even it doesn't even occur to them you know, that they could partially finance just to get the ball moving like, hey, you know, $50,000 up front and then terms over the next couple of years, whatever that looks like. Yeah. So that's really the only financial piece because we're, I am dealing much more with the seller than I am the buyer. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, as, I'm hoping, you know, we're yeah. asking them if they're pre-qualified. Yeah. So it's really kind of up to them. And I would say that's been a barrier too, is that they get all excited. You know, the buyer gets all excited. And it's like, oh, well, I don't know if I can get finance for this. You know, it's like, okay. Yeah. And in my experience, if you are representing the seller, it's one thing if you're just like, here's a bunch of people that want to buy your business. Good luck. But if you're presenting people and if, and if you're fully in, in bed with the seller, that's that's probably not the appropriate term. But if if you represent the seller and your success hinges on their success, now you're taking these buyers and you're you're saying, can you get qualified? And you're asking the seller or you're asking a banker, do you think we can get this business qualified? So it's always with SBA, which is where the you know interest rates are really high right now. But if we can get it um, SBA approved, then then we know that the seller may not have to sell or finance. And as long as the buyer has the down payment, we we could have just made the monthly payments really low for the buyer. I mean, maybe you can get into this business for a hundred grand instead of a million, whatever whatever the full price is. <laughs> um, but that gets to another topic that's specific to salons, which is how good their their bookkeeping is. Can you give me any type of overview of what you see with their books in regards to cleanliness? Um, you know, their their knowledge of their books. Are they doing it themselves? What do you see with accounting when it comes to this particular industry? Is it perfect? Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Matter of fact, about 20, maybe 15 to 20% have it going on, right? They've got yeah. everything organized. They know exactly where their money's going. They know exactly, you know, what's going on in their business. And that's such a small percentage. And yeah. so, you know, my job is not to help them with accounting. I refer them out to other people. Yeah. And so that's one of the first things, yeah, that we deal yeah. with. It's like, so I'll take a look and I'm like, I don't even understand what's going on here. And so we need to clean this up in order to present it in the most yeah. positive light. And I can see areas where there's value, where yeah. a lot of people can't. And so, yeah, no, I would say it's kind of ugly. Yeah, I've learned to ask a few establishing questions to gauge without saying, do you know what you're doing? Like with your books, I'll say, <laughs> do you know what your last year's revenues were? And it's amazing how many people say, I, I don't know how much, I'm not asking them what their cash flow is. None of them know that. Yeah. And I understand that that's a more complicated factor, but I'm asking how much money came through the door last year. And it's surprisingly, a lot of people will be like, I don't know. I mean, I know how much in my bank account right now, but I'd have to go look it up or ask my accountant. Like, you know, the ones that are kind of have their, their thumb on the pulse of the business, they'll be like, 
we did five hundred seventy-two thousand dollars in one cent last year, and I'm like, okay, they, they, you know, I could probably get a P and L and a balance sheet out of this out of this business owner. Yeah, but a lot of them don't know that. Um, and that that ties right into that financing piece that I was kind of alluring to. Like, I want to know how marketable it is, and financeability is a big part. But yeah, I know there's a lot of cash that that goes through these businesses, and and that's you know that's that's a case if their books aren't that great. If you're not taking them to market all the way, that's a scenario where the owner and the buyer can kind of figure that out on themselves. That's a different dynamic than if you are putting out to the world like this is what the books really say. And, uh, you know, that, that's a difference once you take these deals a little bit farther in my experience. Yeah, there is a lot of cash. And that cash, is yeah. one of the things that if somebody reaches out and wants to talk to me about it one of the things that we focus on the most it's like yeah sorry either eliminate that cash yeah or start putting it in the bank because you've got to show that this is coming in yeah yeah and and uh, we have a lot of talk tracks around that it's a real thing and one, one of the most common ones is like congrats you already made that money like you can't make it twice because that is kind of <laughs> that is kind of what what they're looking to do like we didn't we didn't report this cash because we didn't want to pay taxes but now we want to report it so we can have a higher sale price um, so it's a, it's a, it's a tough subject, but, um, we always add, uh, encourage them to do the right thing and, and follow the rules. And, and we can't represent businesses that we know are breaking rules is kind of how we approach it. And it eliminates a lot of opportunities, but I'm, I know that's a big part of this industry as it is with the restaurant industry. Um, well, let's, I, I find that part fascinating. Let's talk a little bit more like, um, what about the multi operators? What are you seeing with people doing multiple units, um, brands coming in, whether it's franchise brands or, or corporate brands buying independence? Do you touch any of that type of stuff when it's more than just an individual mom and pop? We haven't had a whole lot of multi location and franchise businesses quite yet. Yeah. Our sweet spot is usually. Um, $25,000 to up to 125. That's really our, that's, yeah. that's most of where I do now we've done less, we've done more, yeah. but I would say the bulk of ours is single location businesses yeah. that are selling for anywhere from 25 to yeah, yeah, 120. And do you have people reaching out, not because they want to buy that business, but they want to get them out of the way and then put their own business in because they like the fact that a salon was there, but they don't want that brand. Do you ever see that? Oh, we just had that actually. Yeah. And the owners and the buyer was striking a deal uh -huh. and it was all going really well. And we had offers, we had all this good stuff, um, letter pretend ready to go. And the owner let, um, just went, Passed, I'm sorry, the buyer went past the owner and went to the landlord and said, hey, if we just let this lease expire, can I slide in there? Yes. And yeah. Not a good situation. So that, and no, yeah. it's not. And so, yeah, it just caused all kinds of problems. And so, but yeah, we have a lot of locations that have like exclusives, you know, because in shopping centers now, especially they're making um, these great deals where you can be the only hair salon here. Well, if you have a great yeah. location, that's huge. For yes. somebody, they don't care what's in there. They want yeah. the exclusive. So I find that to be one of the best things. You, you made a valid point. I want to underscore that. If you're watching this and you're a salon owner and you're learning about value points and risk, um, presenting to the world that you have secured, you have great terms and they're expiring is an invitation for what you just articulated for people to say, you don't have a leasehold, but I want your space. The landlord, I can find them off the internet. I, I just need to circumvent you. So it's counterintuitive because most owners that are planning for an exit aren't looking to commit for the into the future, but we call it just protecting the space. Like if you don't, if you haven't protected the space beyond the time that you want it, it does limit the value of the business and it opens you up to what you just shared, which is never fun. Yeah. Um, okay. Well. I, I totally, I totally get it. I understand why people like to work with you. Um, let's talk about kind of where you want to take your businesses, like who you'd like to serve as you're, as we talked about, you're adding all these services and you're growing. 
talk to like talk to us about kind of who who you think you can help best as you continue to add services, the types of owners and buyers and people hiring that you that you'd like to attract or serve. Yeah. So yeah. So I think that recruitment is difficult. I mean, we do it, we've done it. It's been the core of our business and that will continue. However, it's far more difficult in my experience than selling salons. And so I, you know, connecting buyers and sellers and making that whole thing happen has been so rewarding. It is unbelievable. And so that is something that I'm going to focus on more. Um, it's not been a huge focus up until recently, but things just keep happening with that mm. whole aspect of the business. And so I'd stupid just not to grow it and see where we can go. And so, yeah, I mean, at some point it would be great just to have a full on brokerage and be able to provide a lot of information leading up to the sale of a salon, you know, really helping. So it not only reduces our workload, but just provides that education as to what salons are worth, you know, what, what can you do to add value to your salon, you yeah. know, and that is of course a comprehensive thing. And so, yeah, I would say salons for sale and marketing are my, my biggest passions at this point. <laughs> Love that about you. I think that's great that you're, you're taking what you know and you're giving it back and, and kudos to you for, for building a business around that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with, with uh, making a living by adding value and serving people. So that's incredible. I think more people are going to want to work with you. So let me have you share um, your two companies' names in the best place to find your companies. I'm looking at them, but I'm going to have you give out the the websites and then any way that you'd like for people to connect with you. Sure. So on LinkedIn, you can hit me up on LinkedIn. My last name is confusing, but it's short, W-O-S. Um, I love to chat with people on LinkedIn, you know, of course, Facebook, Salon Spa Connection. That's really our focus on our social media channels. And so we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook. Um, you can see the very raw version of Susan on TikTok because I do all oh, my on TikTok. <laughs> I just got only... on TikTok. Congrats. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's the only uh, platform that I just let it fly because that's really what TikTok's about. Yeah. You yeah. know, I'm not trying to be cool or beautiful. I'm just trying to just talk about stuff. And so um, and I just started that like this spring and now it's the yeah. fall. But um, yeah, Salon Recruiter on TikTok okay. and our website, you know, you can go um, if you're looking for hiring solutions, salonspotconnection.com. Um, salons for sale are on that. And then Enlighten Hire is our software program. And so that's like a pre-qualification system. So it's for both owners and professionals to really outline what it is that's important to them. And then they get compatibility results. So there's all kind of, all kinds of stuff to visit. That's perfect. Thanks for sharing that. I will try my best to get that in, in the notes below, um, okay. but I'm glad you got that out there. I'm going to give you the last word if you want to if you want to kind of say anything to wrap it up. I'll share kind of my plugs real quick. And I'll just say, obviously, you know, I'm Neil Isaacs. I'm the Raleigh business broker. I typically serve business owners here in the tri North Carolina triangle market that and we like I said, I do sell side. So we do a representation of small business owners that are looking primarily to retire from small business. But a lot of people, I call them young hustlers. They built a business and and they're just ready for something else. That's how I sold my first business. So we help all different owners of cash flowing businesses, uh, not specific to salons, kind of a generalist in this market. And in addition to that, I love having conversations like this with the Susans of the world and just interviewing interesting people and sharing knowledge that business buyers, owners, advisors tend to find value in. So this is this is my YouTube channel. I can also be found on LinkedIn and uh, for aspiring business brokers, I'll share 15 minutes if if you want to learn more about the 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 industry, which is, is a crazy industry. So that's that's my plug. Well, Susan, if you have anything to wrap things up, I'm, I'm I'd love to share the floor with you, and then we'll, we'll call it a day. Yeah, sure. So I mean, we do work with business brokers, and so if you do have a salon, spa, or barber shop, or even a school, we're now selling schools as well. If you're having a difficult time getting in front of people, we do offer marketing services for business brokers, and so that's something that we've just started. I would say in the last six months, just because we were asked to. That's sort of how all of our services come to be. Somebody mm -hmm. says, "Hey, can you do this? I'll pay you." Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. We'll do that. And so we do have um, our marketing is different. 
Um, we do have a very captive target audience. I'm a pro with social media ads. Um, and so anyway, if anybody is looking for assistance, is having a hard time selling a salon, definitely um, reach out and say hi and let, and I'll see if we can help you. You know, we have a hard time with kind of specialty salons. So like kids salons or, you know, and I think everybody does, but it always helps to get the marketing out there. And yeah, no. And I found you on YouTube and I really appreciate you just opening your arms and welcoming me in. I really, I mean, it's just such a valuable relationship and I'm super thrilled to know you. Likewise, Susan, thanks Thanks for that. Uh, thank you for your time. And with that, on behalf of Susan, I'm Neil. Thank you for watching. Until next time, mahalo.